All right. Welcome to Read Aloud. Today is Wednesday, April 1st. Happy April Fools. Um, today, readers, we're going to be continuing our work um, with nonfiction history, and we're going to be paying attention in this Read Aloud to main ideas. And we want to try to synthesize information, pull those ideas together, um, and really think about their significance. And then we're going to analyze and critique events, people, and their interpretations of history. So let's go. Um, before we get started, you're going to see here, um, I have a text. I took a moment to sort of preview this. And I'm reading the title, the text that we're going to be reading, it says, Primary Sources, A Soldier's Account of the Cherokee Trail of Tears. So I know that a primary source is something that actually happened. It's either a document or an artifact or a, a picture from the time period. Um, or in this case, this is somebody, um, it's their letter that they've written and it's their um, version of what happened. So this is a primary source document. So that's really important that we get this person who was actually at the event, their ideas. Um, because this is an account, that's somebody's story, it is a narrative nonfiction. And so we're gonna be using our narrative nonfiction lens. So just to remind ourselves, the narrative nonfiction lens, we gotta think about both the fiction and the nonfiction sides. Um, we're gonna be paying attention to things like uh, character feelings, traits, or relationships, the plot, right? The problem, the solution, or the resolution, a theme or a lesson, and the setting. And then on the nonfiction side, we're going to be paying attention to main ideas and key details, text features, the text structure, and definitely that content vocabulary that we've been growing all along. Um, for the lens, we have to be paying attention to the point of view. How does the narrator feel about parts of the story or their perspective on the topic? So that's going to be really important as we do this work with somebody's account of an event. Um, just to remind ourselves, these are some of the main ideas that we've been tracking all along. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, I've done something a little bit differently here. Whenever you see um, me refer back to one of our main ideas, I kind of put this dotted line around the text so you know this is something that um, we've already been thinking about. It's a main idea that we're kind of just adding on to or maybe revising. And then, of course, we have our content vocabulary that we're going to continue um, growing. All right, let's get started. So this, as I said, is a primary source, a soldier's account of the Cherokee Trail of Tears. So this is a, an interpretation of history. This is something that we um, are working on um, and we want to be paying attention to what is the soldier's perspective of the situation? What did he think? Or how did he feel about the removal of Native Americans? So that's going to be our job um, to do as we go along. We definitely want to figure out what is their perspective or point of view on um, this situation. Um, of course, as we read, it's always important to pay attention to pictures. And if I'm looking at this picture here, um, it says it's a painting of the Trail of Tears showing Cherokee Native Americans walking west after they were forced by the U.S. government to leave their homes. Um, and so I think this text feature, this painting, it's very purposely put into this text. Um, and I think it shows, if I'm just looking at it literally, it's showing people huddled under blankets and freezing cold and snow. And if I'm looking at their faces, they, they don't look happy. Definitely this has got to be difficult, but it seems more than that. I think they look kind of tough. Like he looks kind of determined. His eyes are kind of squinty. His mouth is kind of straight. I think that gives me an idea that maybe... Um, these are tough people to have to endure um, what we already know to be a really difficult situation. All right, let's get reading. Here is an editor's note. So the person who put this text together um, made this note to you, the reader. In May 1830, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act. The law gave President Andrew Jackson the power to grant land west of the Mississippi River to Native American tribes. The tribes, in exchange, had to leave the land where white settlers were to live. White settlers were to live, excuse me. More than 15,000 Cherokee, led by Chief John Ross, signed a petition to protest the law. Um, so if I'm looking here, um, this paragraph here, I think this is some background. Maybe it's giving us an over, uh, overview of the lead up to the Trail of Tears, right? It says the Cherokee were given a choice. They could leave of their own or they would be forced to move. By 1838, soldiers were sent in to remove the Cherokee. It was the beginning of what came to be called the Trail of Tears. 
on their march west, 6,000 Cherokee people died of cold, hunger, and disease. The U.S. soldiers were under the command of General Winfield Scott. Many years later, one of Scott's soldiers, Private John G. Burnett, wrote about the Trail of Tears in a letter to his children on his 80th birthday. So it seems like this soldier is writing about um, this event like many years after he was there. So I'm kind of wondering, how does that factor in like to his perspective? Like he's writing this as like an 80 year old guy. I'm wondering how does that have an effect on his perspective? I'm going to read on to like think about that. Um, some important information here. Um, we had this main idea that I want to add on to that the Native Americans were fighting back. And it says here that they, uh, 15,000 Cherokees signed a petition to protest the um, Indian Removal Act, the IRA, IRA, the Indian Removal Act. We also want to collect some content vocabulary. General Winfield Scott, it says he's the leader of the uh, command of the U.S. soldiers. They were in command of this general, um, and he was the one who was removing them from the lands. So it seems important. I'm going to... Um, jot that down. All right, moving on. Page two. I often spent weeks alone in the woods. Hmm. I wonder what this is going to be about this text. Children, this is my birthday. I am 80 years old. I was born in Tennessee on December 11th, 1810. I grew up fishing in Beaver Creek and hunting deer, wild boar, and the timber wolf. I often spent weeks alone in the woods with nothing but my rifle, hunting knife, and a small axe. On those hunting trips, I met many Cherokee Indians. I learned to speak their language. They taught me how to track and build traps. Hmm. I'm thinking the main idea of this chunk here is that the narrator he learned um, about the Cherokee language and maybe some of their customs. They taught him how to track and trap. Let's read on. In the fall of 1829, I found a young Cherokee hiding under a low flat rock. He had been shot. I carried him to a spring and washed the bullet wound. I took care of him until he was healed, and then we went home to his people together. I lived among them, and they taught me their native customs. Very interesting. I think this is more on the fiction side of things. This is kind of advancing the plot. Like, the narrator is showing that he has compassion for the Cherokee. I think this is kind of uh, maybe foreshadowing what's to come. We'll find out. Let's read on. The Cherokee Indians were being moved. So maybe this will be talking about the Trail of Tears. Let's see. By 1838, I had become an expert rifleman and a good trapper. I was a young man ready for new life. So I signed up to be a private in the American Army. In the same year, the Cherokee Indians were being moved from their lifelong homes. Knowing many of the Indians and able to speak their language, I was sent to the Army group led by General Winfield Scott. There I witnessed the most terrible chapter in the history of American warfare. I saw women dragged from their homes by soldiers whose language they could not understand. Children were taken from their parents. In one home were a frail mother and her three small children. One was just a baby. Told that she must go, they prayed, and then she strapped the baby on her back. The two other little ones held her hands. The move was too much to bear. Suddenly, she fell to the ground and died, with her baby still on her back. In the cold, drizzling rain on the October morning, I saw the Cherokee loaded like cattle into 645 wagons. Their terrible journey west had begun. Wow, that is really heavy. A lot of information there. And very, very sad. Um, I think that this is kind of adding on to our main idea about what was like on what it was like on the Trail of Tears. So um, it says that children were taken from their parents. Like he was a soldier then. He saw it happen. The mother died with the baby on her back. That could be a description I might want to include when I go to write about that because that seems like a really um, powerfully sad moment that might be an interesting um, detail to include. I want to think about that and collect that information. Um, also, we're seeing the point of view really clearly of the narrator, of the, the, young, the man who's sell, uh, telling the story. Where up here, we were kind of seeing it foreshadowed. Like we're sort of seeing like, well, he has like some sympathy for these Cherokee people. Over here, it's very clear that he has um, a definite opinion. 
It's uh, the narrator feels that the removal was awful. And I think there's a quote in here that is really powerful that kind of supports that idea where he says, quote, the most terrible chapter in the history of American warfare right there. He was the witness to that. So that's really telling me his point of view. He feels that this removal was awful. All right, let's move on to the next page. Chief John Ross prayed. I remember him from our vocabulary, Chief John Ross. Um, and so I'm wondering what he's praying about. One can never forget the quiet sadness of that morning. Their leader, Chief John Ross prayed. A horn sounded. The wagon started rolling as the children waved goodbye to their mountain homes. Many of these helpless people did not have blankets and were barefoot. Wow, I'm just imagining that um, in the cold, just like in that picture in the beginning. Um, no blanket and just no shoes. On the morning of November 17th, we drove through a sleet in a snowstorm. They had to sleep in the wagons and on the ground without a fire. As many as 22 Cherokee died in one night from sickness and the cold. This was a trail of death. The beautiful, brave Christian wife of Chief John Ross died after she gave her only blanket to a sick child. Being a young man, I spent many pleasant hours with the young women and girls. They sang their mountain songs for me and to repay me for my kindness. All of the Indian girls I met were kind and tender-hearted, and many of them were beautiful. Wow. That was a lot of information to take in there um, around what um, it was like on the Trail of Tears. So I definitely want to include that in this main idea that we have been tracking. So um, some details um, from the text that many had no blankets or shoes. And it says here that he witnessed 22 Cherokee die in one night of cold and sick in that snowstorm. I think the most powerful thing I think that's really sticking with me is Chief John Ross's wife. She gave her blanket to a sick child and then died her only blanket. Um, and I thought it was also interesting that, that he notes that the Cherokee were still kind to him. All right. Um, the next section. The only, a long and painful, painful journey. The only trouble that I had was with Ben McDonald. This cruel wagon driver was whipping on an old weak Cherokee with a bullwhip. I tried to stop him but he whipped me and cut a gash, a bad gash in my cheek. I fought back with a little ax that I had in my belt. McDonald went down and was carried away. I was arrested, but two witnesses told Captain McClellan the facts. So I was never brought to trial. McDonald recovered. So that's interesting. Um, it says, I think what we really learn here is that the narrator kind of fraught, fought cruelty and he tried to stop the wagon driver from hurting the old, the weak, um, sick um, Cherokee man. I also think this kind of connects to the plot. Um, sort of like the story here, um, he's getting into conflict. He's in trouble for standing up against um, people who are being cruel. So I think that's important. Um, he fought the cruel man with an ax and he was arrested. So even though he was trying to do what he thought was the right thing, he was initially arrested, um, but although he didn't go to trial because um, they did later find out that the man was cruel. Let's read on. The long, painful journey to the West ended March 26, 1839. 4,000 silent graves reached from the foothills of the Smoky Mountains to the Indian Territory in the West. The white race wanted their land, so the Cherokees had to suffer. For hundreds of years, there had been rumors about a rich gold mine somewhere in the Smoky Mountains, and I thought the rumors might be true. Hmm. Interesting. Um, a couple different things. First of all, um, Indian territory is what he's calling this place where they're going to in the West. We haven't encountered that concept vocabulary word, so I'm going to include that here. Um, and also, I know we've already had some information about the gold mines that people were thinking about. So I'm kind of wondering if he's going to talk more about these gold mines in the next page. Homes were burned and lands were taken. I remember one Christmas night in 1829, I was dancing with Indian girls who wore necklaces that looked like gold. The year before, a little Indian boy sold a gold nugget to a white trader. 
In a short time, the area was overrun by thieves claiming to work for the government. They paid no attention to the rights of the Indians who owned the land. Men were shot for no reason. Homes were burned and lands were taken. Chief Junaleska knew President Andrew Jackson. <clears throat> the chief and, his five, and 500 of his Cherokee scouts had helped Jackson win the war of the horseshoe against the Creek Indians. In that battle, Junaleska killed a Creek warrior who was attacking General Jackson. Chief John Ross sent Junaleska to Washington to plead with President Jackson. Well, I guess General Jackson was once a general and then he became president. So he went to, it's the same guy. Um, so he sent June, John Ross sent Junaleska to Washington to plead with General Jackson, with President Jackson for protection for his people. But Jackson ignored the fact that his life had been saved by the Indian chief. Wow, there's a lot going on here. So first of all, I think we can add on to our main idea, like what led up to the Trail of Tears. So it says here that thieves um, uh, who wanted gold pretend to be from the U.S. government and that they shot men and burned their houses and stole the land. That sounds incredible. Um, I can't even imagine that. The other interesting thing that's in this other half of this section here was about Chief Junaleska and President Jackson. Um, I think President Andrew Jackson, this is a character thing. He seems really disloyal. So the Cherokee once saved his life in battle when he was a general, but then later when he's president, he ignored the Cherokee when they needed his help. That sounds like a very disloyal person. Um, I definitely want to collect some vocabulary here, so I'm going to include President Andrew um, it says uh, Johnson here, but it's actually Jackson. That's a misspelling on my part. Sorry about that. So President Andrew Jackson and Chief Junaleska. Those are two people that I definitely want to include in my content vocabulary. Um, all right, let's read on. The true facts of this enormous, enormous crime are being hidden. Huh. Now it is 1890, and the true facts of this enormous crime are being hidden from the young peoples of today. School children do not know that we are living on lands that were taken from a helpless race to satisfy the white man's greed. I tell you what really happened and hope that you will understand that privates like myself had no choice in this matter. We had to follow orders of the officers. Know that 25 years later, I met a large company of the Cherokee in the uniform of the Confederate Army under command of Colonel Thomas. They were camped out at Little Creek in Kentucky. So this seems like um, when this happened, obviously it was in, you know, the time period was in the 1830s uh, and early 1840s. So it seems like 25 years later would be the time of the Civil War. Um, so he met a large group of these people and they were camped at Little Creek in Kentucky, a large group of, a group of Cherokee. Most of them were just boys when they had been taken from their homes, but they remembered me as the quote, soldier that was good to us. It was an enjoyable day. And I learned from them that Chief John Ross was still ruler in the nation in 1863. I can truthfully say that I did my best for them when they certainly did need a friend. So in this paragraph, um, I think we're having a point of view moment here. I think he feels um, that everyone should know about this enormous crime. He really feels strongly um, that it's important for the world to sort of know about this, um, that people were living on lands that were stolen. People are now living on lands that were stolen from helpless people. I also think in his point of view, um, he, he really feels that the soldiers had no choice and they had to follow orders. Um, and he wants other um, to, people to understand that not all soldiers wanted to um, do harm. Um, and then he also wants to communicate that he, would, he feels that he did his best to be a friend. Um, I think it's up for you if you agree with his point of view. This is where we're doing this interpretation of history. But it's definitely his point of view as someone who was a soldier at that time that um, he didn't have a choice and he was just following orders. That might be an interesting debate over whether or not we think he um, should feel um, bad about being a soldier at that time or not. Moving on. Tears and sounds of the dying. However, murder is murder. A killer can hide in the dark or wear a soldier's uniform. Somebody must explain the 4,000 silent graves that mark the western trail of the Cherokee. 
I wish I could forget it all, but the picture of the 645 wagons slowly moving over the frozen ground with the suffering Indians still lingers in my memory. Let the history books in the future day tell the sad story with its tears and sounds of the dying. Children, thus ends my promised birthday story. This was written on December 11, 1890. Hmm. This last part in here, I think he's really conveying the purpose. He's the author of this letter to, these, to his children, and I think his purpose here is that he wants to let people know about the tragedy. Um, and I think he thinks that some soldiers might be guilty, um, but he definitely wants this crime to be remembered. Um, I also think maybe he might feel some guilt himself, even though he sort of talks about how the Cherokee that he met at the time and then later on in life um, felt that he was a good guy. Um, I think this wouldn't stick with him if he didn't feel that he had some kind of guilt for what happened to these people. I don't know. You have to think about that yourselves. Um, all right. Some important information for us to include, make sure that you're getting the content area vocabulary. Make sure that you are <clears throat> jotting it down in your notebook. So you want to add to our content vocabulary the words um, John Ross, remember he's the chief of the Cherokee at the time. <clears throat> General Winfield Scott, he was the commander of the troops, the army that was removing the, um, the Native Americans, I think specifically the Cherokee. Um, Indian Territory, this is where the Native Americans were being Push to move to west of the Mississippi. President Andrew, it says Johnson, it's Jackson. I apologize. President Andrew Jackson, he was president during that time. Remember, we thought he was maybe not the best uh, person in the world. He was a very um, maybe untrustworthy person. And then also Chief Junaleska. He was the guy who had saved Andrew Jackson's life when he was a general. All right, friends, that ends our read aloud. Make sure that you pause the video to grab the content vocabulary and jot it in your notebooks. Bye for now.